Okay, well, welcome to this session on Cuba. Always Cuba, we've called it because since 1959, Cuba has been in uh, always in controversy with the United States and has formed a good part of US foreign policy toward the Caribbean and toward all of Latin America. My name is Sandy Baird and I'm here tonight for the Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement. I'm also here as a member of the Cuban American Friendship Society, which is a small little group that I founded way back in the, really in the 80s, but then solidified it in the 90s. I went to Cuba first in 1981 when the Soviets were there um, and fell in love with Cuba for all of its faults. In fact, Cuba, I believe, transformed my life in many ways. It made me look at the whole world in a very different and I think more cosmopolitan fashion. It made me a lot more aware, frankly, of Latin America and South America and all of the continental United States as well. Um, anyway, so I am then, at, at that time, I founded a group called the Cuban American Friendship Society. And ever since I've been trying to express friendship through that society with the people of Cuba. I try not to take a position about the government I have of Cuba, I have positions about my own government um, and I don't, uh, and I probably have some opinions about their government as well, but that is not my purpose in general. I believe in friendship. I believe in showing friendship and support to the Cuban people. The nation is poor. The people are all people of color and white people who are poor in general. And I believe that we should be supporting them rather than making their life more miserable with embargoes and blockades because they're our neighbors and they've always been our friends. Okay, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about that and then turn it over to the other members of the Cuban American Friendship Society who are with us tonight. And that's Armando Villaseca, the president of CAFS and also Joanne Murad. And here in the room too is Grant Crishfield who is also on our board. Um, and so uh, that's what CAFS is. We're trying to do a trip in May, again to Cuba to take people to Cuba, not only to support them, the Cubans, and to be friendly to our Cuban people, but also to learn a lot about Cuba, which is endlessly fascinating. All right, so I think maybe that I briefly will talk a little bit just about the embargo and the blockade that the United States imposed on Cuba in 1961. Cuba has always been of interest to the United States. So there was talk in prior to the Civil War here that Cuba would become part of the Confederacy. We all have to remember that Cuba is a very Afro-influenced, Afro-Cuban island, influenced by Africans who came here for came to Cuba and to the United States as slaves. And they didn't come voluntarily. They were kidnapped and brought to both Cuba and the United States and then slavery formed the basis of the Cuban economy for many, many decades. Uh, uh, during the Spanish-American War, slavery was eliminated in Cuba um, and then Cuba became more uh, independent from Spain and an independent Republic which had freed slaves. But during the Spanish-American War, which was fought first for, by Cubans against the Spanish in order to become independent, at the last moments of the war, that war was intervened by the United States, who was basically seeking to rid the whole uh, hemisphere of Spanish colonies. And in that war, the United States basically was um, the victor essentially over Cuba. Cuba maintained its independence, but were hampered by the Platt Amendment and other restrictions from the United States empire that wanted Cuba to be under its hegemony and that succeeded. It was in 1904, for instance, when the United States acquired Guantanamo or the naval base that is still on that island is still a US naval base with objections, by the way, from the Cuban government. In 1959, then uh, the leader of the communist movement in Cuba, Fidel Castro, took over the government of Cuba, evicted the, pri the prior president, President Batista, and Cuba became a socialist republic within the, uh, the Caribbean, what the United States would say is its 
sphere of influence. Since that time, the United States has uh, refused to really deal with Cuba in any way, has imposed an embargo against all trade and travel with Cuba, has, the Cubans call that a blockade, makes life very difficult for Cubans in terms of trade, in terms of credit, and in terms of making any kind of progress toward prosperity. That has been in existence to 1959 until the present. There was a brief break in that during the uh, President Obama's administration, who diplomatically recognized Cuba, did not lift the embargo, did not lift the blockade, but at least recognized Cuba diplomatically. When President Trump was elected, that was reversed, and, and we went back to a real state of hostility with Cuba, with minor, as I said, which has always been the case, um, but lifted a little bit during President Obama. That policy of hostility toward Cuba, the embargo, the blockade has been continued with President Biden, though all of us had hoped that President Biden would at least return to the days of President Obama. Anyway, the blockade and the embargo are now 60 years old. Is that right, Armando, I think? They just cel celebrated. They just uh, announced that. There was a big article in The Nation. 60 years of an embargo. It's kind of, in. It certainly is not working. The hope always has been that the government, the people would get so mad at the hardships on the island that they would rebel against their own government. There have been times when, when the Cubans have resisted, have demonstrated at least against the government, but the embargo certainly has never successfully brought about the regime change that Washington has always wanted. And that kind of the embargo and the blockade still exist to this day. It has, in my mind, only hurt the Cuban people um, who still suffer because of poverty, because of shortages, um, and because of just the meanness that emanates from Washington about Cuba. Anyway, I'd like to have uh, the other members of CAF say a few words from their own experience. We've all been there a lot. I wanna talk first to Armando Villaseca, who is our president of CAF, who is, was born in Cuba, left and his family left, I think when in uh, Armando, 1964. Take it over. This is Armando, who worked here for a long time as the secretary of education for the state of Vermont. He's been a principal here. And he and a teacher as well. Okay, so Armando, go ahead. Why uh, did your family leave, by the way? I've always thanks, been Andy. Our, our family left in 1964. I was eight years old, um, and again, we left uh, after um, our family realized that the the initial uh, happiness of having the Batista government overthrown was heading in the wrong direction, uh, particularly around communism. And when the uh, Castro uh, was aligning himself with the Soviet Union, um, and then other things happened, the nationalization of, of, of uh, businesses, everything else. That was an indication that it was not what they were expecting and what Castro had talked about. However, some of the reasons that he went in that direction was because he was dissed by the United States, um, was never taken seriously, was considered you know, a Latin American uh, revolutionary that was not going to last long. And um, so I do believe that much of that, of the reason that he ended up with going towards the Soviets was as a result of our lack of respect and treatment of him. Uh, be that as it may. After, after the Bay of Pigs then, or be what? Even before, even before. Even before. Uh, you know, when he came to New York, he stayed in a hotel in Harlem because, the, you know, he, he wasn't uh, uh, welcome in other places in Manhattan. Uh, again, he was dressed in his green fatigues. Uh, he was, when he came to the U.S., he was supposed to be greeted by Vice President Nixon at the time. Well, Nixon holds him up for close to an hour, making him wait. Again, just those little lack of respects that eventually uh, led to uh, the, Soviet, the Soviet Union stepping in and providing uh, whatever Castro was looking for, which was to stay in power. And um, nevertheless, the fact that the embargo occurred uh, was a major impact on Cuba. I mean, as you look at some of the estimates, it, over the last 60 years, it, well over $1.3 trillion is what is estimated that the Cubans have lost uh, 
because of the embargo. And, you know, it sounds like a big number, but when it comes right down to it, it's a lot of the basic things that as a result of the embargo, people don't have, you know, soap, shampoo, detergent, uh, medical supplies, uh, parts for cars, any of those things. So when you, we talk about the, the impact, it really does impact the average person in Cuba. On the flip side, just as a, a little side note, it has impact economically the U.S. Uh, I was reading a report earlier on Al, Al Jazeera did a wonderful uh, uh, expose type of thing a few months ago on on the embargo and in Cuba relations with the U.S. That the U.S. is losing about 1.2, 1.3 billion dollars a year uh, over the last 60 years in revenues lost from businesses with Cuba. So, so it's not just the Cubans that have been damaged, but the U.S. as well. Ultimately, it is the Cubans who are paying the price of it. And the goal of the embargo, as Sandy, as you were saying, was regime change and reforms. And when they say regime change, they meant no more Castros. Well, the Castros are gone now. So that's one move towards it. Uh, the reforms, no matter what Cuba does, will not be enough for the sort of right wing is Cuban American Foundation and those folks in can South Florida. I, can I interrupt just a question? Influence. Uh, what do you mean by reforms? What does the United States want? I mean, when will the United States say, that's okay now, you're okay now, and we will now deal with you? Do you have any idea? Uh, you know, multiple parties to have elections with multiple parties, even though Cuba has elections. And I've been in Cuba during the elections, uh, uh, and people vote. The problem is that there's only one party. And I think that's the, I think that's one of the conditions that the, um, there's an organization in Cuba with Paya, uh, the Paya's, I was the guy who signed, who got, I don't know how many, 100,000 Cubans signed a re referendum to go to vote that he mysteriously died. His daughter is now in Miami with an organization called Cuba Decide uh, that is right of center, if you will. But nevertheless, what their goal is also um, to uh, have multiple political parties in Cuba that would run, not just one. At the same time, I, she, I believe that they also want to lift the embargo because they realize that that's causing too much pain on Cuba. And again, she uses an excuse by the government in Cuba to blame all of their problems. And up until a few years ago, Sandy and Joanne, you remember, billboards on the highways with a picture of, of Cuba with a gun held to it by Bush and about the embargo or whatever president was in office at the time. So again, it was you know rallying people around a common enemy to be able to uh, accept the challenges that they have because it's a prop, it's the fault of someone else. The internal embargo, you know, Cuba has a bucket load of issues that uh, they need to deal with. Everything's centralized. It's not well run. It's inefficient, blah, blah, blah. But nevertheless, a lot of that is caused as a result of the U.S. You know, remember that the embargo does not allow any product from the U.S. other than food. In, two, in the year 2000, they took food off the embargo list. But nothing made in the U.S., nothing made in another country that is owned by a subsidiary you know, of the U.S. or has a U.S. made parts in it. So that, you know, that's pretty much everything in the world. Uh, so it has an incredible impact on Cuba. And when they talk about changing the, the political structure in Cuba, my family, my friends, people I speak to all say one thing, you lift the embargo and things will change. Either the government will topple and who knows what happens next, or the government will be forced to do a quick 180 and reform uh, because if not, they will be toppled. If they want to stay in power, they will have to make some changes because they no longer can blame the U.S. and all of the problems on the embargo. So, so it's a very interesting thing, and I don't understand why all these bright people, even the, the Cubans who hate Cuba, uh, Cuban government, don't realize that by lifting the embargo, they will guarantee within a couple of years that things would change dramatically for the better uh, in Cuba. But what, what do you think goes on then? Why, why are the... For instance, the Cubans in Miami and the Cubans in Florida really want to keep the embargo going, right? Punish what? Cuba. What? Punish them. Punish them. Punish who? The Cuban people? Is that right? Punish any, yeah. Punish the, Cuban, punish the government, but in order to punish the government, you got, you're punishing the Cuban people. Uh, that's the whole, the whole position. Now, granted, that's changing. Uh, folks of my parents' generation have now passed away. Who, you know, my father was out there throwing himself. He lived in Miami on the streets when Elian was being returned to you know, to Cuba. He was, you know, nothing, if the, those who stayed in Cuba, that's their fault, you know, they, mm. they could have left and they stayed, really? so they have to be punished along with everybody else. That was my father's and many of those positions. 
uh, I think that's evolved because many of those people have passed on and you have younger Cuban Americans who were still raised with that sort of philosophy as I was um, growing up in, in a very Cuban dominated community in North Jersey. But once you go there and you when you see what's really going on, yes, the government's a mess. You know, it's a it's a it's a basically it's a communist dictatorship to a certain extent. Uh, but it has so much potential, and as you say, Sandy, the people are wonderful, uh, and we bring groups to Cuba, and everyone leaves enamored with right. The, I fell in love with, with Cuba country. in 1981. Yeah. I was whether it's the, inte the intellectual curios curiosity yeah. that they have about learning more about us or the music or literature or the connections with other countries and uh, you know the, the, the influence that Cuba's had both in Latin America and Africa and in Europe for, is, has been incredible. So you look at all those things, what potential do we have? And what a loss that we have in this country uh, you know, that so many Cuban Americans have been so successful if they had stayed in Cuba, would they still be the same? I mean, there's a, a whole lot of uh, issues going on, but I'll well, stop know. there. And Joanne anyway, can I ask you one there. more question, one more question. Uh, so what was your attitude growing up? My attitude, grow my attitude growing up was that everything Cuban was bad and the con and Castro was bad and everything that they did was uh, was hurtful, inefficient. Uh, they were communist, you know, they were part of the Soviet bloc at the time. So everything was was, was that. Uh, Alpha 66, which was a, a sort of a cute right wing Cuban organization, was based in Union City, New Jersey, which is right where I grew up. Uh, so everything was very much anti-Castro. But again, you know, you read, you listen, you, you learn from other people. I had an uncle who was a wonderful, um, uh, he was an attorney in Cuba and probably one of the most intelligent people I've ever met and really talked to me a lot about both sides of the equation. And he then did. when I finally went, uh, now my uncle was considered a communist by many people just because he was willing to look at both sides. There is no both sides in Cuba. If you go to Miami right now and you go to uh, La Carreta or, you know, and, and Little Havana, these little restaurants where all the Cubans hang out, you know, what I'm saying right now, it would be blasphemy. <laughs> Better be careful. They're tough yeah. to those Cuban exiles. Robin, did yeah. you have a question? You're muted, Robin. If the government is such a mess, how is it that they provide a, a doctor and a little medical clinic on uh, every other block in in uh, Havana? I mean, their medical service is extraordinary, wouldn't you say? Their, med their preventive medical services are, yeah, and I'm not arguing that's Robin. I know, I visited them, I know that. But to the Cuban American population here, that, that doesn't mean anything. It means absolutely nothing. You know, there may be doctors in every in every neighborhood, uh, but there's no medicine. You know, they would they would that's what the Cubans would say to you. Or that that uh, that's sort of the answer. Doesn't matter the fact that wonderful educational system up until recently, I think, was one of the top notch in the world. Yeah. Uh, the and free. Uh, you know, a social service system that protected all of its people. A medical system that provided, as you were saying, uh, medic free medical care. Uh, and good medical care to people. Mm -hmm. That those were all. That was all background noise to the Cubans and, and to many of the Cuban population in Miami. Wow. Uh, let me just ask one other question. Do, 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 is your family? Are you? Do you have property there or houses there that your family is wanting to get hold of? Or no. I. I mean, my. my it's funny. My my dad has passed away, but for years he was saying that he had a deed to his grand to his parents' land. Which I, you know, who knows where that, but to me, that would be, that's not something that I would be willing to uh, pursue because, you know, once you leave a place, you've left, you know, and where my family's land may have been, you know, 10 acres or something, there, there may be several uh, buildings housing 30 families. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that whole, that a whole idea of uh, going back and getting your properties is a, a lost um isn't that still an issue with some? I, uh, I think it's an issue. People it is an issue. It is. Issue. Yep. And actually, U.S. courts under Trump have approved two of them uh, to go forward. Uh, and one of them happens to be on the land where the Havana airport. International Airport is. <laughs> the Jose Marti right. Airport, right? Right. Yeah. Okay, I'd like uh, another comments from our other member of CAF Joanne. who's with us. And that's Joanne Murad, who spent many months in Cuba. She was Burlington College, had a overseas study program at the University of Havana. Um, sometimes I think of it and I feel almost homesick, Joanne. Uh, yeah, me too. Years. 
um, and Joanne too. And she was the resident director who lived, and Robin too, both these women were resident directors, lived in Cuba for six months, Joanne longer than that, Robin for one semester, right Robin? Yeah, and then yeah, I went and, back to fill in it uh, for a couple of weeks. Yeah, and so I wanted to ask, both of you, but particularly Joanne, because she also was born in Venezuela, she had, but you also have Cuban connections too in your family, don't you, Joanne? Yes. And that, was, and that was a really interesting story how we found that family. But anyway, so I wanted Joanne to sort of comment on what her life was like in Cuba and whether it was, uh, well, you tell me what you think about it in terms of human rights and liberties and democracy. Yeah, well, um... I guess uh, the, the first thing I was gonna say was that I, thanks to you, Sandy Baird, who uh, started the Burlington College program, yes. that in 2008, I believe, yes. and, and then I took over the next year as, as the resident director for at least another six years, that it was just an incredible uh, sort of uh, boots on the ground experience where you get right. to know the people. And having taught Spanish, I of course had that um, that asset to get along with people there. And as well as that, I also had family. So my cousins, cousins and cousins, second cousins, third cousins, fourth cousins, um, still live in Cuba. Uh, but the family was, as uh, with Armando, um, there were family members who could not stand living there and left. Uh, so the family was divided quite uh, drastically for many, many years. And uh, up until my going down there, there were some who had never talked to their family members in the US. So it was, it was a Because time of politics, Joanne, because of yes, politics? Because of politics, because of politics that somehow if you stayed, that was your, your bailiwick and that was your problem and we don't wanna hear about it. And, uh, but then the ones who stayed actually have made quite a, a good life. And as my cousin always said, said, where else would you be able to go and have, have uh, all the services that we have? Of course, you might say, even though it's supposedly a classless society, that there is a bit of a, a class um, jump in her case, in, in one specific cousin's case. Um, and she does, they do have, have a lot of entrepreneur uh, abilities and they've started businesses and do very well. They have a bar, is that correct? They have a bar and they did have a restaurant. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I think it was Prince, uh, Prince Charles and his wife oh. made it there their restaurant some years ago when they were visiting Cuba. Um, but in, in all in all, of course, um, what my, my sense of Cuba was that, that the people are so incredibly uh, friendly. They don't see us as our, what our government is. They simply see us as Americans and they love Americans. So there was never a sense that, oh gee, you know, you're you're part of that um, uh, the regime, the the capitalist regime up in in the in the U.S. Uh, or the the blockade for that for that matter. Um, but uh, some little things about about them, of course, was the fact that it's such an, an artistic, um, impressive uh, art scene in Havana, uh, music, dance everything which is really part of their DNA, I, I think. Movies, movies. And movies, yes. Oh, and the film, I had I actually forgot yeah. about the films uh, because theater, film, dance, jazz clubs, um, classical ballet, arts and crafts, museums, orchestra, symphony orchestra, all opera. of Opera, opera, I saw opera. opera. <laughs> I know it, yeah. That you would never expect to see in mm. this little, uh, downtrodden island, supposedly. Um, but and, and most of, of, of it was, of course, the, the fact that I was able to get to know the, the Cubans um, and get to understand how giving they are. They're very generous. Of course, they also want some things back because they don't have many things. 
so that you become this sort of give and take type of uh, relationship in some cases. Um, but of course, they they did love Obama. They were very, very sad that uh, he no longer could be president. And uh, of course, there was always the hope that the, the idea of opening Cuba would continue. Um, but just as an example of their of, of how they are. Um, I don't know if you remember the Kitty Genovese incident in New York City some yes. back in the 60s where no one came to her aid. And when in Cuba, when I asked someone about the students and I said, what happens if they're on the streets and some they have an accident, what do they do? And the woman laughed and said, what? There will be 20 Cubans yeah. on top of you, taking you. As a matter of fact, they'll probably uh, they'll all have to fight over who's going to get you to the hospital and who's going to get help for you. So that's kind of what they're about. Um, and of course, uh, you would ask me about, about uh, Cuba being a police state. And I didn't, I really don't think I ever saw, um, let's say that, that the optics of a police state are difficult to see. Yes, there are some policemen walking around in Havana and uh, there are, they have, I saw them stopping some teenagers, um, but as a rule for tourists, there is no one taking, taking part. Crime, of course, there's petty crime, uh, but I never felt that there was a sense of fear on the streets because of it. Um, and being Cuban, of course, is, is being able to get around regulations. And even though they are aware of them, they know exactly how to, how to get around them. And their favorite saying is, uh, todo tiene solución menos la muerte, which means everything can be resolved except right. death. Right. Um, right. And so that's, that's their, their mantra. Um, and then finally, the, the, the fact of the lines, all the, 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 um, the difficulty of getting things there um, and it's part of everyday life. Patience, however, is a virtue. Um, so they know how to make the best of it, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think those of us who've gone there and traveled, we all have a lot of respect for their survival skills and their endurance. But I do believe that what has sustained them throughout all of this is the fact there that they have a bedrock belief in their sovereign Cuba. And that as, and my husband gave me a, a, a quick um, um, a prop, well, it's a quote. It says, El vino de platano. This is Jose Marti, who was the George Washington of Cuba. Uh, El vino de platano y si sale agrio es nuestro vino. So wine from plantains, which of course we know doesn't come from plantains, but if it is bitter, it's our wine. And mm. so- because we, we made it. So therefore, it's our our decisions, our choices. And I think that's sort of what's what's really kept them going. The United States um, doesn't understand that. Yeah. And the US doesn't understand that. I really don't think they see that uh, that strength that Cubans have. So what about um does anybody else have any questions? How about you, Eric? Eric is um a colleague of mine, um, and he is helping to, I hope, to put together a trip for us to go to Cuba maybe in May. Eric is from Africa. So I just wanted to, you maybe Eric, could you comment on what interests Africans or how, how, do, how do Africans perceive the Cubans? Uh, well, uh, depending on the countries, those who are under, you know, the um, brainwashing of the colonial powers <laughs> will, of course, you know, think that Cuba is the devil. But overall, you know, there's some kind of pride, you know, for a big brother, uh, which despite, you know, who, despite, you know, the, all the, uh, the, the I mean, the, uh, embargoes and everything that the U.S. and uh, the Western power did has managed to survive and then also to uh, to uh, to have one of the 
best literacy rate in the world and also a good uh, system. It's mitigated, you know, it's like 50-50. Uh, Some people say maybe Cuba should have been more docile, so they would have had like more money, more glittering things. Uh, some people, some um, in the other hand, you know, like Thomas Sankara, for example, in Burkina Faso, who has been a, a very much of a, a revolutionary figure, has always had like good connections with Cuba. Not only just to say, uh, you know, uh, uh, go to hell, uh, the West, but also, you know, to show that we can do stuff, even though we don't have like all the IMF and all these, you know, backing. But Cuba also is, uh, is like a big brother when it comes to music, for example. All the bands, like my father, his brothers, and like the big brother be before me were all listening to Afro-Cuban music, you know. Uh, everybody has like a name, Pedro. My, my uncle was Pedro, just because they're always a Pedro who knows <laughs> how to sing. Everybody was dancing, you know, and then uh, so... Cuba is not only uh, um, inspiring for its uh, political struggle and, and then resistance, uh, you know, towards the West, but also because it's a place of uh, diversity. Uh, we haven't heard about, you know, we didn't know for a long time that Cuba also was plagued by uh, some racial, you know, uh, uh, challenges. So when I, when I, because the image that we always had from Cuba in Africa, at least, for what I know is like uh, a place where everybody, it was a paradise for everybody, you know, no black was like having trouble over there. It was the revolution. And, and then when I heard that, you know, uh, these challenges are very much acute right now in Cuba, uh, it was a shock. So uh, uh, it's, uh, we it's love bad. Cuba. It's a mixed bag. <laughs> but, but Eric, I, I specifically wanted to ask you though about uh, doctors. That, oh, yeah, you yeah. know, uh, a lot of countries have, you know, uh, had the help of Cuba when it comes to, you know, for example, I think uh, during the Ebola crisis, you know, there was some help from Cuba. And also, uh, you know, many countries have had like uh, teachers, doctors from Cuba. And, 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 and it's, uh, I think, for example, Burkina Faso under uh, 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 Thomas Sankara have sent all his, um, you know, his students abroad in Cuba rather than sending them to Paris, where you know the um, the tuition would have been like ten times what they would pay in Cuba, uh, and then the doctors who went to Cuba got like good education as well. So, uh, 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 and then some countries, of course, have had like the help of uh, Cuban doctors. Which are who are always seen as you know some kind of you know pride for for, for the continent. Yeah. Do others have uh, comments or questions? So, what is the problem then between the United States and Cuba? What do you think? Or I think it's it's unfortunate because you cannot judge. It's hard to judge. You know what Cuba has done or not done you know, with regard to sanctions, like it's like, you know, you want someone to be the, you know, uh, number one uh, uh, tennis player, but you know, you steal all his rackets and then, you know, he doesn't have any ball to play I with. Like so it's, it's very difficult to, you know, to judge Cuba, you know, I wish there was no uh, uh, embargo, then we would have seen if, you know, uh, Cuba was not able to do something. So, uh, I know that you know uh, uh, he, he, Cuba has always has, all, has been a, a dictatorship. I mean, like uh, you know, but to me, it's action reaction. Like, like if you see, for example, what happened to uh, Mugabe, Robert Mugabe, uh, uh, the former president of uh, Zimbabwe, have been for a long time a good boy, a very good boy to the British and to the US. But the day he decided, like. Listen, you promised me to give me, like, to, to help me do that re, uh, land reform. Tony Blair didn't do anything. I don't know if it was uh, 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 Clinton or some, some other president didn't do anything. So what did he do? He started, like, you know, distributing the land to the people. He became 
the best, the worst enemy of the, the West. So he got all the sanctions. Then people come later and say, oh, Zimbabwe didn't do anything. Education is like, it's a mess. How can you be a mess if you don't have the mean, if you're crippled by sanctions? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Zimbabwe was the pearl of, you know, uh, you know, you know, Africa at some point. They did work, but the sanction come. And then action, reaction, you make the guy becoming more and more paranoid. I'm pretty sure Fidel Castro, knowing that he could die every day, you know, will even see a Cuban like any, anyone in front of him as an enemy and maybe sink into, you know, some kind of paranoia. The same thing happened in Guinea with, uh, with uh, uh, Sekou Toure. Everywhere leaders have been attacked, have been crippled by, you know, the Western world, they turned into tyrants more and mm -hmm. more. You maybe, know, Armando, maybe, is that your point, Armando, also, that, that these sanctions have both strengthened the Cuban government in a lot of ways, because then they get to blame the yeah. the mess on uh, the on the United States and sanctions, so it strengthens them, and while it still hurts the Cuban people. But is that what that was what Armando was kind of saying? Is that correct, Armando? Well, I mean, I think that Eric's point is correct, and I think that a place like Cuba never had a chance to to be able to prove whether their system was going to work or not because mm -hmm. they were hamstrung from day one. You know, when President Kennedy in February of 62 signed uh, the order of, limit, you know, the uh, economic embargo right off the bat, that limited Cuba's ability to be able to see if the system that they were trying to implement would work. Obviously, many of the things did work, but always uh, with one hand tied behind their back because of that. Now, again, you know, there, it wasn't like the, the U.S. didn't have some issues, for example. You know, when they start nationalizing U.S. businesses and not providing any re re uh, remuneration back, that's obviously a problem, you know. So when things like that happen, it just makes it worse. Right or wrong, that is how the Castro regime wanted to approach things um, because he believed that all of that was the, had been abused by the, by the foreigners. All the money that was being made in Cuba was being taken out of Cuba. And the... Um, the elites, the very small number of elites in Cuba, were the ones benefiting when there was extreme poverty, lack of education, uh, you know, medical system that was not existed, um, a very small middle class, which is where um, our family came from, um, and but at the same time growing. Um, what Castro came in saying, trying to get rid of Batista, the dictatorship of Batista, the goal was get the revolution, a couple of years you stabilize, then you have open elections with multiple parties. That didn't happen. At that point, that's when the nationalization started happening. Cuban Americans, Cubans in Cuba started fleeing the country in droves. Soviet Union started coming in, taking advantage of it. And then that just, you know, it entrenched each side, the, the Cuban Americans in the US, because they always thought they would go back soon. They never expected that this would be 60 years later, that they would, they would never have returned to Cuba. Cubans, on the other hand, now that they were uh, dependent so much on the Eastern Bloc countries, not just the Soviet Union, but East Ger you know, Germany, East Germany, uh, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, they, those were huge uh, trade partners with Cuba. Uh, yeah. But again, Cuba had a, a mono uh, economy. It was sugar. And, um, and again, when you look at the embargo, they were using equipment that was by, built by the Americans or at least American money in the 1920s and 30s, so they couldn't get parts to replace them. So the whole system was, was, um, was not provided any opportunity to be successful because of the embargo. Um, now, the, the, the embargo is well past its time. There's no reason. We're, you know, an embargo when we were when we had an uh, economic embargo against South Africa, against the apartheid government, that was a worldwide embargo. Cuba, it's the U.S. and in only and the United, U.S. right? Only the U.S. Only the right. U.S. And then when you go to the United Nations every year, there's resolution to to um, uh, end the embargo into uh, through the United Nations, and the only couple of countries that vote the United the United States, I think the Marshall Israel. Islands. Israel, Israel. Always, but Israel has a has is a is a trade partner with Cuba. So I know that's, a, that's the, the the interesting thing. So uh, again, uh, the disappointment that the Cubans have right now, they were you mentioned before, Joanne mentioned before, Obama, he was loved 
literally loved by the Cubans. When he spoke to the Cuban people on television and on the radio without any uh, interruptions or uh, screening of what he was saying, I mean, he was saying things in Cuba that had never been said before. That was the most the hopeful baseball game. <laughs> the baseball game. Baseball game. Baseball game. But in the 20s, since, since, since the year 2000, when the first year I went and, and go to Cuba and spend a lot of time there, I had never seen Cubans so excited about their future because they saw this as the beginning of the end of the embargo. Private businesses, as you all know, were flourishing. Uh, limited private businesses, but it was still moving away from a government-centered occupational structure to a much more diverse structure. Uh, even now, the Diaz Canel government, which has been a disappointment, uh, mm -hmm. the ones with the president of Cuba right now, has, has opened up more. I think, you know, there are now thousands of different uh, professions that Cubans can do independently. Uh, but nevertheless, that's still, uh, it's all centralized in the agric from agriculture. So, so again, there's, there's, um, there is that disappointment in Cuba right now that President Biden was is not uh, following through with his promises that he made on the campaign. And something as simple as just for everybody, you know, remittances. You know, oh, yeah, that's but, one of the things why that. Why don't you explain what that is, Armando? What's in a, a remittance? What do you mean? Well, I mean, when people send money to to another country. Uh, okay, when and, Americans though here send money to the even to their families in Cuba, right? Yeah. Yes, uh, I think most of the, the remittance is going with Cuban Americans sending money to their families. And, you know, there were multiple agencies in Miami, Western Union. I could send money from, you know, from the Hannaford's in Essex uh, to Havana with a limit of $400. And those were things that Cubans were using to help start those businesses. You know, if you were starting a small, uh, you wanted to be a mechanic, you needed to buy some things first to get started. That's where some of that money was helping. Uh, you needed money to start a business. That's where it helped. And now that's gone. And President Trump got rid of that, you know, 2017. And that's something that there's no reason not to have that open. Um, the, the argument is it's helping the government. I mean, it's helping the government because they take a small percentage of remittances, I'm sure, as everybody does. Uh, but the money is really helping Cubans. And, and again, I have family and friends in the United States that are Cubans, and it's hard for them to send money to Cuba. Um, and, and they used to have, you know, during the Trump years, go to Canada and send money from Canada. But now that's become, you know, obviously more complicated. So again, the, the disappointment, my friend Francisco, which you all know, uh, Sandy and, and, and uh, Joanne, I have a good friend who just turned 90 years old, true communist, true believer, uh, but he's a capitalist communist. Uh, he has his own business. And I just spoke to him the other day and he, and he said that his heart is broken by Biden because he was, there had been so much anticipation that he was gonna make some changes Maybe not get rid of the embargo, but expand what President Obama had done. And again, nothing has happened. Um, okay, I want to uh, ask any. First of all, anybody have any other questions? But I see Diane yeah. Ayer. Oh, sorry. Um, and thank you, hey, Diane. Diane and Mary, for chiming in yeah. because these are two women who went to Cuba with calves a number of years ago, and I've never even heard what you thought about Cuba, so I'm glad And then went off on their own after us, you of know? Of course, yeah. Well, yes, those, yes, yes. those are those kind of women, they do go off on their own, you know? Well, we, Joanne was there and Armando was there, but actually the little trip, the side trip that we took is precisely the topic I wanted to bring up. And it has to do with the sustainable farms that were created during this special period. And the one piece in the history that you haven't really talked about is the special period. Yeah, right. Yeah. The time that I went previous to our CAFS trip was about natural resources and the agricultural farmings, farm um, changes. And I think that's something that we can still learn from is how under the difficulty of the 80s and 90s, Cuba was able to gain its own footing on feeding itself. And mm -hmm. now it wasn't as easy in the cities as in the rural countryside, um, but food and energy was figured out and it was totally isolated during that period because the USSR had crashed. And so its access you know, beyond the US, which was never accessible, but access to materials, goods, energy in particular um, from Russia, from USSR 
was totally unavailable. And so there was a decade that people really did, they lost 80% of their body weight. I mean, there was yeah. a huge drop that. in body weight across the population. Um, but they learned to be resourceful and they learned to use non-pesticide food farming systems that we have yet to figure out how to do. And um, so the availability of recapturing how farming could occur is, is iconic in, in worldwide systems. And that story is not really out. And, and, it, and it's a really a strong story. Um, hey, can I just jump, can I just jump in on that? That yeah, is yeah, a yeah. Uh, one of the things that uh, because the organic farming out of out of necessity, not necessarily out of choice. Exactly. But now, yeah. but now it's flourishing there. But what a market! When I was talking to, uh, I don't know if you guys went to either Finca Marta or to the Agraponico with us when we were there. All of went, them. Yeah, all of them. Okay, uh, you know what they're saying is that the, the, the organic market in the U.S. for them would be huge. Again, you know, you pick, something could be picked in the morning by the next day. It could be in the distribution system of the U.S. and South Florida. That just to be able to use that experience of organic farming, and because it is so popular internationally, that if by lifting the embargo, it would encourage more farmers, it would encourage more of that, uh, and and that's just again one slice of the embargo that impacts a huge number of people. And Cuba right now still has to import eighty percent of their food, which is a it's a, it's a crime. That's you know, great. it's crazy. I was I was struck by the importation of rice from Vietnam. Yes. Yeah, rather than Louisiana, for instance, or you know that they have to go all the way to uh, Vietnam. Yeah. You know, but that, that, that gets back to a different social impact and that rice was not an, a right. natural historical food, right? So, you know, back to which food has been brought in and colonized, rice was one of those. And that's why the dependency from out of the country. Right. right. Um, yeah. And also Vietnam and, and Cuba had a very good uh, back and forth between the uh, the Vietnamese who were staying at the uh, um, agricultural home that I was living in, the residence, mm -hmm. and they were coming to learn about sugarcane, and and of course uh, teaching about rice, or at least trying to get people to to um, uh, to understand that how how to grow rice, but especially they were helped a lot with sugarcane. In, uh, in Vietnam. And so the two governments had worked together as well as others in, in uh, Latin America that came to- Well, they, the, Cuban, the Cubans also work with China, correct? Oh, yes. That's, I guess so. Um, I, to get back to the special period though, um, especially for those who might look in later, I think many Americans aren't aware of what the special period was. And that occurred in 1991 when the fall of the Soviet Union meant that the main trading partner of Cuba collapsed totally and, uh, and it totally affected Cuba so that they went through, I don't know how long, five, six years of real deprivation and a really, really hard time. I was in Cuba during the special period. What? A decade, the decade. The whole decade. I was in Cuba during that period of time and a friend of mine that I met there who I'd met here had lost 50 pounds. Yes. I mean, people were, however, however, somehow they did survive. They did survive, which is really rather an incredible testimony to their resilience. You know, it made them tougher. It made them, the other thing I've always noticed about, noticed about Cuba is they're incredibly innovative, don't you think? Oh, yes. Of, yeah, like much. they keep these old cars going. You know, these well, old I mean, Plymouths and Cadillacs. How do they do that? I think I think poverty and makes makes you innovative. I think when you have nothing, you become innovative. No, yeah, but but I, what what, I what happened in Cuba is office. what happened in Ghana too. You know, Ghana was like because of Kwame Nkrumah, who was a revolutionary who wanted to drift away from you know the European powers and build one Africa, one economy and stuff. He was combated like so. Afterwards, Ghana got into a, a series of coup d'état and stuff. But today. The Ghanaian have become like 
very much ingenious. You know, they learned everything. They did everything by the, on their own. Compared to the French colonies, like, uh, you know, the country where I come from, who were babysitted by, uh, by France, you, you couldn't even go to the toilet by themselves. You know, they're collapsing while Ghana is, you know, I hope that one day you know, the U.S. will will come back to the census and that also, you know, the Cuban, uh, you know, people will push for more democracy over there and then we'll see, you know, what Cuba, you know, what is the potential for that? Because I'm pretty sure that, you know, the countries that have learned to do things on their own compared to those who were like very much assisted by... Uh, by assisted the, or... I mean, dependent too. On dependent, the, like yeah, dependent, right. you know, yeah. and then so much so that you know, Ivory Coast cannot even, you know, uh, you know, uh, produce a needle while uh, or, or some chocolate while they're producing, you know, uh, uh, you know, fifty percent of maybe the worldwide production of uh, uh, chocolate. I want to. I, I also want to know. I mean, to, uh, I try to understand. You know, if there were so many, I mean, partners other than the U.S., how come you know the embargo on the U.S. is so hurting? Because it's know, also the corruption. No, I think. Well, I think that it's not just if if you're asking the question, why does the embargo? Uh, why has it been so harmful to Cuba? What about other countries? The Cubans also describe the embargo as a blockade, so that the United States seeks to interfere with third parties in the mm. trade with Cuba, and they've been very successful at that. Wouldn't yeah. you say, Armando, isn't that correct? Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I was saying before is that, uh, you know, the embargo is not just for Cuban, uh, U.S. products and U.S. businesses, but let's say, you know, I'm going to use the example. I, years ago, I opened up a bank account at RBC in Montreal, Royal Bank of Canada, because that was a way for me to, to be able to send money to Cuba prior. This was probably in the late 90s uh, before things started opening up a little bit. Well, about two years later, I get a call because then this way I could use my card, that ATM card. Anyway, it made it easy for me to deal with money in Cuba. Then, like two years later, I get a note from them saying that they've been purchased by uh, uh, a U.S. bank, or at least part of them have, been, have now as a U.S. subsidiary, and they no longer will be able to operate in Cuba. So, so here's an example of a Canadian bank or Canadian company that, because now they have partially U.S. ownership, that that bars them from doing business in Cuba. The Bank of Paris has been fined hundreds of millions of dollars for uh, dealing with U.S. dollars from Cuba because the U.S. dollar is illegal. It's illegal for, for Cuba to deal with the Cuban, with the U.S. dollar. So did they, one of the- Did they pay the fines? Did they yes, pay, they the, pay the fines? Yes, they pay the fines. Oh, yes, they pay the fines. Because if not, they won't be able to do any business with the U.S. So they, they really, they have them by the, you know, by the throats. But that's why Robin and, and Joanna, whenever we go to Cuba, we're, when we're exchanging our dollar, we're paying, you know, we're getting uh, 75, 78 Cuban cents for the U.S. dollar. Now, please, let's say from a worthless car, but because 10 cents out of that was the additional charge that they put in because that's what it cost the Cubans to then change the money. So the embargo has impact on, on them from, again, from the uh, organic farmers, uh, to the uh, banks in other countries, to people like us who are trying to send money to family in Cuba. Um, and now, you know, again, I have two family members from Cuba and other Cubans who live in Vermont. There's probably like uh, half a dozen of us that I know, real Cubans who came recently and they can't send money home right now. All the agencies in South Florida, mm -hmm. Miami, that were always sort of fallback ones are not able to send money. Mm -hmm. So it really becomes that when people go to Cuba, you give them money to bring to family and then they figure out, you know, how to get it to them. Um, so that's, I mean, look, it's a, it's a harmful, it's a spiteful is what it is. It's a spiteful yeah, policy sure. that in 2003, I don't know if you, many people remember, there were several attempts in the house and even in the Senate to pass, to, uh, lift the embargo and president, the old Bush, uh, threatened to veto it every time. So it died. It, it seems that the West is very much like, uh, uh like, you know, like the, how France, you know, for all these years, I've asked Haiti for having been so rude yeah. oh. to ask for the independence to pay oh, for I something. I know. Same thing in Ivory Coast and all 15 countries has to give you a heads up on our communications on, you know, uh, the fall of the French empire in West Africa. 15 countries of Africa 
you know, when they do business with the rest of the world, for example, they sell cocoa to the U.S., 60% of the dollar, I mean, the, you know, foreign currency that they get is held in the Bank of France. And in return, France give them a phony fiat money, like a monkey money, and for them to stay like in a bubble. And in return, these, these countries cannot you know, benefit any fluctuation from the dollar. You know, Same way, when France wanted to get rid of uh, Laurent Gbagbo, uh, the kind of rebel, the guy who became like a little bit you know, uh, less docile, they put an embargo on the medicine, the, the drugs, for, for, for months. The Ivorian couldn't go, I mean, couldn't get any medicine because, of course, all the medicine, all the drugs they get is produced in France. So same way, you know, use like these crippling sanctions and inhumane yeah. sanctions. Right. And then and then come a, a few months later to say, oh, this is a failed country because they couldn't even, you know, do something. The, the problem... Um... I think that Americans don't seem to realize is that sanctions, embargoes, blockades are war by other means. These are considered acts of war. And to really, so in a sense, we've been at war with this island of Cuba, um, a largely, uh, you know, a, a, the biggest island in the Caribbean, but still a rather, rather small part of the world, mainly with black people and people of color, we've been at war with them since 1959. So how, in a way, can we then expect that island to succeed? Wouldn't it be better politics to let them succeed or fail on their own, right? Right. Just remove all this nonsense and see yeah. if it can survive. But, but, there's, any, but Sandy, there's the hate. I mean, yeah, I one of the things I, I'm gonna compare this to Vietnam, just yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the Vietnamese, who fled Vietnam and right. came to the U.S. was a, were the largest uh, detractors to opening up relations between the U.S. and Vietnam because right. they lost things. You can understand that. I mean, I understand why my parents who had to give up their life and give up, you know, everything, or at least they felt like they had to give everything up, go, could feel that way. But that's not the that's not the way that a country should be managing its foreign relations based on how several thousand uh, people feel about the what they lost what's in our best interest our best interest forget about the cubans in yeah, our I best know. interest is to lift the embargo and let us and cubans trade let us travel there then travel here music arts theater you baseball. know product, baseball everything. baseball whatever the case would be yeah i agree you know it's in, we're it's our our best interest is to lift the embargo but because you have you know this right wing voting block uh, in South Florida, and read the Miami Herald. I read it every day, and it's just, it just and it's still as hateful as ever. Oh, oh! Is it really? <laughs> the Miami Herald is a, is a, is is left leaning for Florida, but I'm saying the, the <laughs> comments of the people. I mean, really, the Miami Herald is is um, I mean, Miami Miami is Dade County, Broward County, Palm Beach County. Thank God, are still Democratic counties in Florida. But, but the other stuff, Cuba, it, right? Now, the one thing that combines many Democrats and Republicans is that at the same time, the Republican senators and Congress folks from uh, Iowa, Nebraska, Oklahoma, they want to lift the embargo because they see that as business, right. uh, uh, business opportunities, whether it be wheat, Louisiana rice, Tyson Foods is the largest importer of chicken parts to Cuba. So, again, all I mean, this would just be a, a a, a really boom for businesses for many of our in our agricultural in our tourist industry as well as the the, the just the better relations between our countries the place will be flooded with tourists from the united states if we could go there freely flooded it's beautiful it's interesting regardless of your, what your politics are to me it's one of the most interesting places on earth really the culture yeah. is vibrant um it's just it's a, it's really a melting pot too what yeah. It's a melting pot of yeah, so many things. Yeah, it is. It is. And I can I can get real Cuban cigars. I can't find them. You, you, you can. That's right. No, you, you can't. You can get them in and Canada, but now you can't go to Canada either, <laughs> Mr. Onion. I'll bring you one yeah. next time. I have All some right. Here. Merci. Okay. All right. I think without uh, we have. I guess we're pretty much out of time. Any last yeah. comments? Okay. I did want to ask Mary in particular, my old friend and colleague Mary Twishel. Did you like it there, Diane? And um, Mary, did you have a good time? It was great. No, it was very, it was very interesting. 
Yeah, okay. I heard that you were the belle of the, of the ball, Mary, that everybody loved you like crazy. Did you know that? Uh, no, I didn't. Well, I'm telling you. How could I? I don't know. But now you guys went. You guys went and spent a couple of days in a in a in like Vinal in Vinales area. Uh, uh, Las no. Terrazas. Um, in Terrazas, yes, Terrazas. where we yes. went. Yes. We stayed on a farm, and we, you know, so again, you know, getting out of the city and looking at the natural resources in the farming communities. Um, but I'm going to bring it back to what Sandy was saying about tourism, and. And much as I'm skeptical about American tourism, I think there's um, a, a bigger built-in, um, not fear, but, but dynamic about mega corporations coming in, um, taking over the food systems, whether it's rice or, or sugar cane or whatever, um, that, in some strange ways, the gift of non-American intervention there yeah, yeah. Um, has made it hasn't helped the country grow economically, but has given them their own voice of existence. And that's yes, I agree with that. I agree with that. I remember sitting in a park once in Santiago with a British a man who we were watching a high school band playing, and I, I said the music was great. And I remember saying, these people have so little, but this is so amazing. He said, if, they, if these people have so little, Britain should have a lot of that. Because yeah, that, that's it, also a philosophical question. How right. much is good? Like, because some, I agree with you, you know, I, you know, like in Africa, for example, like, uh, okay, they judge the countries by the amount of money coming from like the foreign investors. A few jobs are created like, uh, jobs and 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 then oh this country is doing very well but you know is it doing well for the country so to me it has to be yes opening up you know Cuba but you know to what extent I don't know you know can you because it's very frightening also to see like uh, an avalanche of yes. you know uh, big corporations buying McDonald's. the whole country. <laughs> yeah. I saw one international company once which was Benetton that was the only right. you know, Capitalist right. corporation that I saw there. No advertising either. Okay, a little advertising for the government, but very little advertising that for any products. But anyway, I think we should end tonight by reminding people though that CAFS wishes to do a trip to Cuba in May. We're going to concentrate on a people to people trip showing to Cuba and having learning about Cuba, but also showing them our continued friendship and support of Cuba because, like us, the Cubans have had a very difficult time during COVID. Um, and so I think it'd be very uh, uh, wonderful trip to show our humanity and to share our common humanity with our friends in, in Cuba. And that'll be in May. If anybody's interested, they can get a hold of me or Joanne or Armando. And I guess that's it for tonight. Okay. And so to bring things to Cuba. And yeah. what? Yeah. And, to bring, and to bring some things bring, to Cuba. And bring right. something, I'm sorry, to bring some things to Cuba, yes. Bag to bring an water. extra suitcase full of stuff like toothpaste, like shampoo, like those things that they really do not have at this moment. Okay, well, thank you all very much, and we'll see you, you. soon. Thanks. Bye.